uh, let's let's talk through some of the the origami and kind of the assignment that we were thinking about uh and then we'll transition to uh uh maybe around in uh 10 15 minutes of the year i'm gonna ask you to present a little bit on both the mask uh, but also a little bit on the history of the the elephant project itself as well and just kind of your reflection sure. as a as a maker in india uh, and then I think we're going to transition to you, David, uh, maybe around, what time is it? It's 8.30. What time do we end? 10-ish. Um, um, yeah, so maybe around 9.15 or something. Uh, you like presentation or just... No, you could just talk, whichever way, like whatever. I think it would be fun to hear. Uh, yeah, I think historically, your own journey as a maker has been really fun people will enjoy that mm -hmm. yeah and i think then we'll transition a little bit to also starting to fill out some idea board related things but we can move that for uh, okay so anybody can take the mic it's open mic uh, we can talk about uh, what did you guys build uh things to show and share on the origami front i see objects <laughs> no, i know you guys built stuff uh so who built what uh what went through what was the process like yes My, so this is both sumer and i um and it's fairly simple we uh -huh. built like a wallet to start and uh, -huh. uh we were in, impressed by like how much force there is uh, uh -huh. in like the clamping um and then we thought like oh this kind of balances uh like an object in here is going to be balanced straight up uh -huh. um and so we decided to build a tripod out of it so the idea uh -huh. being like if all you had is a sheet of paper you, you can make a tripod out uh -huh. of it so we built these like legs for stability uh using the like scraps that are left when you take a sheet of paper and turn it into a square and tear it off and uh -huh. then i don't know it's been crumpled yeah. in my bag so i don't know if it'll uh -huh. actually stand now but okay yeah it's it's yeah. it's pretty crumpled now but yeah. but in theory yeah. it would stand yeah. up a and where does the the clamp force come from that's actually very clever i mean in terms of the compression force yeah i think it comes from like uh just naturally like when it's when it's folded in uh we fold we kind of fold these triangles here and then fold mm -hmm. them uh one more time over with this like kind of rectangular fold i think when you do that twice on both sides uh -huh. it creates a like a clamping force mm -hmm. yeah um yeah no, that's really fun i can uh <laughs> Taking Zoom calls, uh, is, <laughs> especially if all you have is a piece of paper. Uh, other things, I see a big oh. kite there. I'll have to talk about the kite. Okay. Yes. Well, we start with the theme of water and like uh -huh. things that would move or like change shape in water. So uh -huh. like our early ideas were like trying to do things where we discovered like water can work as glue kind of when it dries and mm -hmm. it like works differently for different types of paper. So we were going to try to like do something that releases certain objects at certain times and like if you put this in water over time it'll like unfurl uh -huh. and let go of things and we're trying to like do you want to test it oh um, <laughs> this has been sitting yeah. in there for a while but, like, but you guys tested you played with it yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. what's what's the force why does it unfurl do you guys know anybody wants to guess like we just noticed like one flap like the outer flap would be the one that would that's very like interesting yeah. why would it do that anybody wants to guess very thin sheet of paper i'm assuming yes when in contact with water essentially is actuated it's quite subtle okay we'll, we'll keep thinking about it and it, it would go but the problem was like the thing that we were trying to get released would like stick to the top layer still if it was mm -hmm. floating mm -hmm. so that's why we tried to start making something that would like twist yeah uh -huh. as it happened uh -huh. and like so this would like fill up with water and start to sink we were trying to weight it so it would twist but yeah. it was really hard to control yeah mm -hmm. um, and so yeah. the connection between the two is that then like this this would... acts as a weight mm -hmm. for the i see i see to anchor it I guess that's one of the main challenges we had is if you didn't have like a container that was deep enough, yeah. where, like things like everything would kind of just like settle. Our layer of water was. I like you should be able to solve. Yeah. 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 So the reason it twists is if you think about it, you have to have asymmetry for it to unclear. There is an intrinsic curvature, which is the curvature that you've created. Intrinsic curvature is a zero stress curvature. 
So the fact that the object, if done, no force applied to it has intrinsic curve, like it is just curve. Mm -hmm. But when water comes in contact with one side and not the other, you can see it's the elastic properties of that paper has changed from the top and bottom. Mm -hmm. And so the stable configuration for that is a different configuration. And so it's only if it was completely soaked in water, the hypothesis is that it won't do that. So it's a transient. So in some sense, a flower like that should open. But when the water has gone all the way through, it should go back. Or, uh, you know, it's possible that the water traps this as well. Uh, and I think, yeah, I don't know if uh, some of you have seen this, but just as a maybe this is a worthwhile thread from an origami perspective. And this is what I was hinting is a droplet wrap. So these are spontaneous wrappings of thin sheets uh, with water. This is called capillary origami. I think what you did is sort of the opposite of this, but uh, I'll just play this. Let me share my screen for one second. Uh, so the idea is very simple. Uh, the challenge we were talking about was how to create uh, motion in origami uh, using water and moisture. So I'll just play this. It's quite surprising what you're seeing. So thin sheet, water drop, and what has already happened is that the entire thing has wrapped around just purely from contact. Uh, so again, thin, do you see that? So, and now it's drying. So that's an object that, uh, and again, this is slightly different than what I just described in the context of, and uh, lots of people have been playing with this notion. Uh, so I'll just play that one more time, just so it's clear. Uh, you can take a triangular sheet of paper as long as it's elastic and just purely using surface tension. Uh, and then you saw the moment it dried, it unflurred back again. Uh, uh, let me shop. Okay, other uh, other origami projects. Yeah, I think since you guys have that big kite, let's talk about the kite. Um, yeah, after um, the water like fiasco that yes. we tried out, we decided that we also wanted to just try a basic kite and uh -huh. see whether it works. With, and then we were thinking of, oh, if this doesn't work, we can try it with a different paper, try a different structure, but it worked really well. Uh -huh. So I guess it makes up for the, your typical kite shape. And so we just like started out with a, a kite and started fortifying the edges with tape or wherever it started ripping. And it worked for, we were flying it for like an hour and a half. And it, in the air? Yeah, yeah. it withstood. And yeah. there's no wind, so we kind of had to run with it. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so I think this is another kind of a fun thread. It, was it natural to couple the a uh, thin sheet with the uh, the stiff structure, for example. What's the coupling between the two? Yeah, so there is. We ended up using these. Um, so the tape rods. or no? Yeah, there's, there's tape and there's wooden rods. But then afterwards, um, we started thinking of ways we could do it with just paper. We didn't end up doing it because uh -huh. it was like one a.m. Yeah. But. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I yeah. mean, that's an interesting question. Can you actually make a kite purely out of paper and no paper yeah. structures? Yeah, because we were thinking um, instead of using rods and tape like this, what if you try to kind of like cut slits on the edges or around like the center, wherever the rod is, and like fold it up a piece of or paper or use a stiff piece of mm -hmm. paper, like cardboard, mm -hmm. and like threaded it through or something like that. Uh, and uh, does anybody else makes kites? Uh, I'm just curious if anybody on the call has extensively made their own kites. Uh, I know this is a big tradition in India. Uh, go ahead, Smriti. Were you going to say something? Yeah, when I was young, we used to make kites. Uh, it was like part of like one of the celebrations, religious uh, festivals around here. So we used to get like wood and really thin paper and then it was a family thing like we would all sit and make and then fly them yeah i have very very fun memories of uh, kite making actually in general uh, yeah i mean i think a couple of threads to say just as you're thinking uh one recent trend that i have seen is uh there are sets of folks who have added a little bit of electronics to paper to kind of make paper drones uh, and so what is the lightest motor you can add and then also add control. Uh, 
uh, and that would be a fun space to go in with like, okay, now you have this passive structure, how would you add some little layer of control to it? Uh, especially in terms of, uh, there is a balance between the amount of weight a structure like that can put, uh, but what would be the electronic analog uh, of what else can you add to it? Uh, you know, of course, uh, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, there's a, an entire field that has grown now, which is called kite power, which is wind power, but delivered through kites. And now that's an extreme of kite making. Uh, I should show this because uh, these are old friends. So one of the companies that they started uh, was called Makani Power. Uh, and I'll show you guys this just as a context of you start building things like that, and this is where you end up. So Makani now was then bought by Google and now they transition from kites to actually hard structures, but I'll show you guys their original uh, kites. And let's see if there might be a video. Uh, uh, these are all still uh, hard structures. I'm looking for the really old structures. Um, uh, so the idea is an airborne wind turbine. And the reason you're trying to do that is that the wind is much uh, faster, uh, farther you go. You can think of the boundary layer effect. Uh, which no kite. I wanna show you guys the inflatable structure, which I don't see popping up here. Uh, this is the evolution of an entity in you know 15 years almost. So they have now become uh, uh, okay. So I think some of the original structures. Uh, the images, uh, as you see, that these are hardened structures, but some of the original structures were primarily inflatable kites. Uh, so I think this is one example. Uh, these were some of the earlier examples. So they were large fabric kites, then anchored in a place, you get access to very high altitude winds uh, that you can't get access. The weight of the structure, most of the wind turbine, the challenge is to keep the rod stable. Most of the cost, 70% of a cost of a wind turbine can sometimes be in the pole not in everything else, which is surprising. And so the answer to that is no pole. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, if some folks want to think deeply about on the renewable side, uh, this is a phenomenal example. And you know the, uh, the analogy of the kite scenario here is the way you extract power is you tether it. So the kite doesn't go anywhere, but it keeps spinning, but you have a very large cross section associated with the wind. Uh, and just that rotation uh, is what's converted in. And then the generator is very much like, uh, so unlike you can think about the scenario of now, because you have a blade, you're actually flying. And then you can work out a way to extract power out of it. It still happens to be an incredible, there's a lot more technology development in space in terms of thinking about safety of these ideas. Uh, but on the other hand, just, uh, Again, I think since you reminded me of the kite, it's really the power of play that although you might start here a couple of years later, you're doing something with this object that uh, most people haven't dreamed of. Uh, any other examples of stuff people want to show? So yeah. Kuji and I, we wanted yes. to make something to hold up a mask when we take it off. Uh -huh. So we started out with the idea of using the elasticity of the um, mask. Uh -huh. Oh, so that's cool. Like this. Yeah. But then we realized that not every mask has an elastic strand. Yeah. And also, this is a lot of material for it to be stiff enough yeah. to hold it up like this. Uh -huh. So we thought we could take inspiration from the hexaflexagon uh -huh. <laughs> and just make a foldable structure that's more portable. So we can 
a little flat. Oh, uh, this is this turns into a table. Uh, kind of. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can stand it over like this, and then put it on. <laughs> yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Uh, one thread that also comes to mind is remember. Uh, we had said origami loosely defined. This idea of thinking about a universal joint in origami is actually very useful because it is still nice to not use glue and tape, but you still want to make joints uh, where normal origami might not. And so I can already see you came up with this clever latch <laughs> inside uh, that you can. And then, yeah, try testing that latch for a lot of different configurations. Yeah, uh, because it's just a nice motif to have because you can always just make that uh, as a way to connect things. So I don't know if people noticed it. The reason it's standing all taxes around uh, there's a very it's a nice, clever way of latching things. Um, We're inspired by snack boxes that have yeah, that latch. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we thought this is really pretty, uh -huh. so I made this. Uh, but it's not very practical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But do you know the full pattern that you ended up using here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We looked it up online. Yeah. Do you know what it's called, this one? Oh, no. No. Is this the Mira origami or no? It almost no, looks no. like it. I don't know if people can recognize it. Does anybody recognize this full pattern? So I think, yeah, with, with four of these, it's a variation of Mira fold. Uh, but what's very cool is that you also have curvature in the other direction. And it's, I'll pass this around. It's surprising to feel that it's actually stiff in this axis now, which you wouldn't expect from a sheet of paper that where is the stiffness in this axis coming from? Like when it's folded, clearly there is no stiffness in that. It's, but when you do fold it, uh, yeah, it's actually quite stiff in that axis. Uh, and one last thing is that last time I made a big version of yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. I tried making more. Yeah. But then when you extend it, the degrees of freedom is higher. Uh -huh. So it, if you collapse it like this, it doesn't always have enough yeah. memory to go back in place. Yeah. But, so it's yeah. not binary as it was feeling yeah. like in this yeah. structure. Yeah. Uh, There's more of a jiggle to it. <laughs> yeah. We were talking about this joint in some sense, and um, it's. It's very clever in the sense that it maintains orientability of a surface when it folds. So this orientation and this orientation is the same. Unlike a normal <laughs> fold, that when you fold a piece of paper, the orientability changes. So if I was to take a regular piece of paper, and if you draw a dot here and a dot here, you can see that these are now opposite of each other. Unlike that, What's unique about this fold is it maintains orientability. You can see that the surface is still pointing in the same direction. But I, I, but I, this is really fun. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. the, it's sort of, this is called the pleat structure. And then the question to think a little bit about is, you know, because you can make pleats without cuts, right? Uh, but it's very interesting how these sets of arches come together in some sense, whether, uh, you know, I think you did this intuitively to decide to put a cut here, but if you don't cut it here, uh, is it easy enough to go back and forth or not? I'm just thinking about, uh, because so the just as a kind of a formal term, when there is a cut, this is now a kirigami structure. And so there is still lots of mysteries around how kirigami actually works. Uh, in the sense for why these sets of cuts really enable, because now there are very sharp singularities. There can be stress points and you can relieve stress that you can't relieve in origami. So I'm curious, think a little bit about it of intuitively why this cut helps, right? If you do something like this without the cut, without this opposite thing poking out, what would the mechanics look like? And why, why the cut actually really makes this a snap almost? Yeah, I tried making the top portion thinner, but uh -huh. that reduces the memory. Uh -huh. um, and if I found that if I fold this, it gives it more stiffness. So it also in increases like its pro like probability of going back in place. Uh -huh. So I think the cut does help. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, and I think it's uh, uh, it's a fun space uh, of designing with kirigami is, is quite complex. 
but there are many packaging structures that you use in your daily life that have origami patterns. Um, anybody else? Yeah, Marek has the rest of our design. Yeah. So you're thinking of like um, things that could like soften impact or like. Uh -huh. um, oh, that is cool. Of, like, collapsible things. So uh -huh. we like, experimented with like cardboard and more like chipboard and like other uh -huh. stiffer paper. But another thing that I was thinking about is like storage, like collapsible storage. So maybe uh -huh. like if we like made like boxes like this, we could. Uh -huh. Yeah. But maybe even before that, you should talk a little bit about that object. It's quite puzzling to see. Yeah. You see these boxes appear and disappear. Yeah. So first of all, is there a cut? Are, are there cuts in it? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so talk a little bit more about the object itself. Yeah. So each of these are like their own papers. And then like I basically just like tape them together. Uh -huh. But um, all of them are like folded in the same way such that like when yeah. you like push on it, it like collapses. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to show this on the screen just for everybody. And uh, uh, it has a really interesting twist degree of freedom, which is, uh, so it snaps, right? So can people, oh, sorry. <laughs> so it just, every box collapses with a twist. Oh, that is absolutely fantastic. It is elastic when you, that's why I'm saying like, it's really fun to play with it. It really wants to be in two configuration, either folded or unfolded right there. Uh, I'll pass this around. Uh, we also saw, so, sorry, sorry, Rami, I'm not in class, but I can join you from here. Yeah, um, go ahead. We also saw that online, um, Professor Renee Zhao, who's in mechanical engineering, is experimenting with this right now on campus. And she adds magnets across the folding uh -huh. pattern so that she can actuate it in different ways. So she turns on the different um, magnets at different times and makes it move in very interesting and wonderful ways. Yeah, I've seen one of those PNES papers uh, and kind of one of the threads there is again going back uh, this thread of right now you're starting with origami, the moment you add magnets or other forces to it, you can stabilize their state, you can actuate, you can add more degrees of freedom. Yeah, I think what would be really fun, Mehret, is post that paper uh, on the Discord and the origami channel. Uh, it would actually be fun for people to be thinking about adding degrees of freedom to the objects that they've been working on. Um, Okay, let's keep going because I want to save some time for kind of the two case studies. Uh, we'll go a little bit faster. You want to share? Yeah, I made like a catapult. Oh. <laughs> like, low key, like, yeah. I, I have more experience with foam core, so I yeah. kind of just folded it. Yeah. So it's kind of, I just paper it kind of off. Uh -huh. Are you about to shoot that other origami <laughs> this way? <laughs> yeah, that was good. Okay. It's hers. Ask her before you do it. Yeah, so like I, I crumpled up some paper and uh -huh. just pulled this back. Uh -huh. Oh, that's actually quite that's yeah. pretty interesting. I was I was thinking that the thing would collapse with that much of a Yeah. Um I just but have to hold this down. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I think the whole purpose of this is that you kind of start <laughs> building intuition for how for uh, something like the half that stiffness. And then again. That same analogy, I had said origami broadly defined, so you can immediately see origami and rubber bands take you in a totally new space. And, you know, origami and rubber band is what saved us from the pandemic, right? I mean, this is all it is, is origami and a rubber band. But then you can imagine how elasticity in, a, in that kind of a sense can be incorporated. So think about those sets of threads is that once you have a set of a structure, what is that thing that you want to incorporate in? that gives you a general motif to play with. It's not the specific object that you're making, but you're opening up a space for you to think about. Uh, anybody online that has anything that they wanna share from the origami assignment? Hey Manu, it's, uh, it's Jackson. I'm a little sick today, so I'm online, but- uh, Yeah, go ahead, Jackson. I, yeah, I also made a wallet, um, which was pretty cool. This is like my literally my first time ever doing an origami, so. It was cool to make something that could be practical. Yeah. Um, what would be cool is if you made a wallet out of pay, uh, money. That would be cool. <laughs> I don't know how I'd pay for anything with it, but it would be cool. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think uh, bring it to class, Jackson, next time you're in. Because definitely. I think it would be really fun to actually see it. 
Definitely. And I also made a basketball hoop, which is cool because I'm a big basketball fan. So, uh -huh. yeah, oh, is that? No, no, this is separate. No, what is that object? Oh, you tried to. Okay, this is a basket, not yeah. basketball hoop. <laughs> okay, okay, I was just connecting that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a little better at shooting on a real basketball hoop, but I'm working on shooting on the origami one. So, <laughs> yes, I think uh, crumpled pieces of paper have been utilized in graduates school offices at basketball <laughs> for a long time. Uh, uh, any other comments before we dive in into kind of the, the main course today? Uh, anybody else wants to share any origami structures? Uh, since you're talking about rubber bands, Manu, I shared pictures of uh, one of the things we experimented with on the on our Discord, um, we were working with the laser cutter to see if we can score paper. And that got us thinking about oh, what about meta materials? And we actually uh, made a few structures, the Mira pattern with Duron and uh -huh. uh, using masking tape in the back. Uh, we connected it together. And then I made, um, I tried to make it with 3D printing as well with fabric in between. Uh, the, the 3D printer clogged on me, but you can see some of the experiments I did. I uh, added holes and uh, looped through some rubber bands to make it act, uh, bounce back like the paper it did on a little sample one. Sorry for the photo dump, everyone. I thought that it would group the photos together, but it did not. No, so, so I'm just looking in Discord. Uh, the origami in Lab 3 origami. I go Lab 3 origami oh okay i think is this elaine you or uh oh, it. It. yeah okay i'll go all the way to the bottom um okay, yes right here yeah um uh, oh i see your point okay so you have two layers uh you have a stiff layer and a soft layer yes uh and then at that oh let me just share my screen so if folks go on the Discord channel, uh, this is Mehrit's sort of a comment. And I guess, you know, this is also another range in origami structures where you have extremely elastic structure coupled with an extremely stiff structure. Uh, and then these are also called a class of self-folding origamis. Uh, so self-folding in the sense that in this scenario, uh, you can create a system, and I'll just show this on a. Uh, uh, self folding origami where you can link a single degree of freedom uh, and the compression of that leads to uh, formation of the object, so you can start seeing these sets of structures. And what's happening in here is many a times these folds energetically are coupled in a manner that if you just compress it, it's only going to fold into one configuration. So it's rather than what we do serially where you add certain sets of folds, there are constraints that are built. And because it's a stiff structure, it... So although this is, looks very high degrees of freedom, so degrees of freedom mean how many different unique degrees of freedom or folds you can create. And in architectures like this, you can actually couple them together. So this looks very similar in that uh, context. And I think, yeah, when I watch the video, you can see a little bit of that sense. And then I'm assuming, what's the elastic structure here, Merit? So what's it's just masking tape. tape. I yeah, I, I put it together with masking tape. And in the last pictures, you can see I drilled holes into it and started tying it with rubber bands. Because mm -hmm. in the paper mirror fold, if you see, if you pull two sides of it um, away from each other, the two, the other two sides sort of come together to yeah. make a almost a gripping structure. So I was hoping yeah. that maybe we can try that with um, yeah, the this, this looks very classic as an example of what is a snap buckling. So you can see that there are two energy configurations. When there is a rubber tied in here, either this configuration is energetically favorable or the other way around. So 
either the fold is happy to be a mountain fold or a valley fold, but it is not happy to be flat. And that's called classic snap buckling, where the fold energetically is much more, uh, uh, it would want to transition from one to the other. So if you are to then push on it, for example, it will snap to the next place. And so I think in general, the broader idea is how do you exploit snap bucklings in origami? Most often, the fold energy uh, is minimized, that the bending energy is very, very low. Uh, but you can imagine making an origami sheet that you just shake it and boom, it pops in into a shape. So rather than classically in origami, the flat sheet is the lowest energy configuration because there is no bending, which always requires energy. But imagine if the flat sheet was not the lowest energy. So that's kind of, I think when you're tying these sets together, I can see a sense of uh, you're changing for the flat sheet to not be the lowest energy state, but either the mountain fold or the valley fold to be the lowest energy state. Uh, which would be a very yeah. clever. And so I think the way to do it is if you make the kind of origami structure that you made, but fold it in a place and then pour some kind of an elastomer in the shape you want it to be. Like, you know, use these groups as channels and pour some rubber and let it cure. Once it's cure, it actually, that's its lowest energy state. And so when you bend it, it'll do all kinds of strange things. Uh, yeah, I think Merit, you should you should push on this a little bit since you have uh, all the access. It'll actually be fun uh, to see what types of structures that you can make. Um, okay, I think we're going to transition. Uh, I think as I had said in the past, you know, uh, the fun to be had is only when you uh, play and make stuff with your hands, uh, and. Uh, I think we're not going to keep track of any of this other than just when you make stuff, do share it with other people. Uh, put that on Discord. So it would be very, very, it would be really fun for all of you uh, to just whatever you made, put that on Discord and I'll kind of take a look through. And then we can have certain sets of much deeper discussion. Even the simplest of thing that you might be discovering by play has conceptually a deep idea hidden behind it. And you just have to kind of tease it out. Uh, and that only comes from discussions. Uh, uh, so you should, you're allowed to play, but then if you don't share it, then, then it doesn't evoke the kinds of discussions that we would want to have. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, and speaking of discussions, I want to introduce a very good friend of mine, Subir, who's joining. I met Subir through a class itself, uh, that uh, Frugal Science, a very first class. Uh, but we have worked on many things together. And I think in the COVID context itself, a significant portion uh, of uh, folks that were engaged were deeply engaged in many COVID projects too. So I'm not going to do justice. Uh, so I'll let Subhir do a quick intro. And I think Subhir, it'll be really fun yeah. to just share a little bit. What does it mean to be a maker uh, in India? Uh, you can talk about broad range of projects, but I think, yeah, it would be really fun to talk about uh, the mask testing setup, but also uh, a little bit on the elephant project itself. Sure, sure. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Manu. Uh, I mean, to cut the chase, um, I've learned a lot, and I'm so happy to be here again and again. I mean, it's amazing. Um, so on the mask testing device, so this came up during the COVID times. So maybe that, Sudhir, the masks, can you do a quick, yeah. can you quick do a quick intro, sort of your history? How did you end okay. up where you are in life? <laughs> right, right. Okay. I, uh, I always liked to build stuff and, uh, I was building stuff from childhood. I saw my father building stuff, repairing cameras and stuff. So, uh, I didn't know what it was called. And it's only now that the word makers have become popular, but we have been, uh, and so I did all my uh, education thinking I'll be, sometime I'll be a scientist, sometime I'll be uh, something else and all that. I didn't know what this word is called, but now I know after many years that we are makers and that's what I want to be. Um, and so um, I started a small shop, yeah, a workshop, a prototype design, shop in 2017 in India, in the city of Pune. 
and I've been listening and talking to small. Uh, so the focus is to design for people who do not have resources. And that's something of an engineering challenge by itself. Uh, that's the reason why I love those kinds of problems. And so Google Science fits right inside that zone. Um, and I'm still a student of Google Science. I'll always be a student of Google Science because it's when, when it gets to the real application, it's really complicated uh, to design something frugal that will last long, that will be intuitive and will serve the purpose. Um, and so I'm always learning. And uh, nowadays I do a lot of projects. Uh, some of them are, uh, for example, a mass testing device. Um, then I'm building a, which is Manu, which is, I, I really got excited because uh, I'm trying to build a laptop stand uh, for people who are bedridden, right? And to access laptop, uh, and that's an unsolved problem, it seems, because um, uh, they they still do a lot of jugard, which is an Indian word for bricolage, or um, and they try to uh, pop up their laptop in a certain orientation based on books and stuff. So there's no proper stand for uh, bringing the laptop to a person who is injured or spinal who has spinal cord injury. So, uh, and I'm using a lot of origami techniques, just that, uh, just what you, all of you were sharing and uh, was just a delight to, to hear it here. That's, so, that's um, fantastic. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, one of the nice things that also just as a reflection, uh, what Subhir does is he embeds himself uh, in the communities. And so most recently it has been uh, the sets of communities and, you know, you won't discover this very specific problem that Subir just described, that people that are bedridden, I mean, I was bedridden after my surgery, and you can imagine that it's uh, only then when you put yourself in that context do you even realize that there is actually a problem. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, that's phenomenal, Subir. Uh, and I think maybe one thread that would be valuable is, uh, uh, sure. I don't know if you want to share your screen, it, or you can just show the video yeah. for the project itself and talk through it'll be fun to sort of see the visual incarnation of the objects. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll share my screen. I have, I'll do a quick round. Um, so this is, uh, if you can see, this is a one method of Beautiful. propping up a stand. And uh, what I've done is, what Manu, you were talking about the tension, right? The spring yeah. tension of a rubber band. So yeah. this is a steel cable that passes through these bistable uh, modular thing. So if I tighten the steel cable, the structure remains in its place. If I exactly. loosen it, it can be oriented in any, any way. And each of these module bends either in, so it's a bistable module. So any shape can be ideally realized from such a device. Yeah. So you so, can get a general curve, any three-dimensional curve yeah. can actually be modeled with this. Yeah. 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 Now, now the challenge is how do I hold a three kilogram laptop at the end of this, which I'm failing miserably on. So <laughs> this is my, by the way, this is the 15th prototype and I'm still failing. So I don't know how many more um, prototypes I have to make uh, to, to get some success. Yeah, so Beer, uh, we can talk about this, but can you also just mention the fabrication uh, of, uh, yeah. I'm assuming this is uh, some kind of a metal structure that you're using sheet bending. Yes. Yeah. Sheet bending, yeah. So again, uh, this is just laser cut sheet bending. Um, in India, apparently this industry of laser cutting metals has become accessible. So it's fun. You design things and you can get sheet metal bend. And this also uses a lot of origami uh, techniques, I suppose, that yeah. you have to bend things in a proper way, assume, and also think of the strength because this is going to now hold a lot of load. So the bend actually helps uh, increase the strength of these materials. Mm -hmm. uh, and then is there any bistable latch other than just the, because I think maybe one thread I can think about from a force point mm -hmm. of view, uh, the stiffness along the arc gives you, uh, uh, you know, if I was to write this down in terms of the bending stiffness and the torsion of this object, yeah. uh, there might also be uh, that because your cord actually goes axially, for example, actually, I mean, yeah. this is a general, I have to think a little bit, but I can imagine because your cord is 
symmetric to the structure, it cannot provide torsional stiffness. So torsional stiffness mm. is coming from the geometry of the structure yeah. itself. And so then yeah, you can imagine true. because torsion and twist, so torsion is, and I take a cable and I do that. Yeah, uh, but then yeah. you know these sets of things are coupled. Many times you've played with is if you twist something too hard, it suddenly snaps out of plane. So because these right. two degrees of freedom are coupled, uh, it yeah. might be it would be fun if you just essentially add a load step at a time, say one kilogram at a time, mm -hmm. and actually watch the deformation of this object for any given yeah. type of curve. Uh, that could give you the sense of how do you reinforce a st structure like this that remains yeah. strong in at least the desired configurations. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, because I so, can see the challenge that you want it yeah. to be completely uh, freeform, which latches, mm -hmm. if you were to provide latches on those edges, uh, they yeah. might not remain freeform. Uh, but at that mm -hmm. same time, the moment you want it, it should snap to become infinitely stiff. Correct, correct. It can be tightened by the extension of the cable, which is just a screw yeah. tightening. Yeah. But you're yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm thinking is mathematically, it might actually require to have More. multiple strings mm -hmm. or at least one string that's not axisymmetric to the curve. I oh, have to I think see. more about it, but I yeah, see. this, I mean, this is absolutely yeah. beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Any comments, and, ideas? Uh, How would you make this much stiffer? Anybody in the, in listening, uh, anybody has kind of an, oh, <laughs> go so, ahead, Sumir. So, so this was something similar. This was the uh, flex, uh, the, how do you say, uh, uh, the flex joint, uh, yeah. bistable flex joint. So there's no hinge here. And these uh -huh. are all metal strips. And uh, I was trying to create the same structure using something similar. So no hinges. And uh, this apparently, uh, yeah, I couldn't make it work very well. But this is the, I forget the word, Manu, that you had. And I've, I've learned a lot of these concepts from the last frugal science class. So Yeah, these are flexure I'm designs. Really trying to Compliant, use them. Compliant flexure flexure. design, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we'll cover yeah. flexure soon. Um, but I, I also love the idea of what you're at least sharing, Subhir, is this notion of just like you play with paper, you can also play with metal now. I mean, it's yeah. just because laser cutting in metal has just become so. And so in some sense, you can spend an infinite amount of time modeling and designing this, or you could just build it and test it and get, get an intuition for the kinds of structures that you might not get otherwise. So I right. can see that sense of play. At, and then effectively, uh, uh, you know, I'm assuming in terms of the cost and the these structures being very lightweight, is yeah. probably what matters. And all of them would be collapsible. So you can think about shipping. Absolutely. Yeah, there's lots of advantages to build it in this way. In clinical so, settings, I could also see if you are really in hospitals or mm -hmm. somebody who is worried, then you could really clean a structure like this too. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that was the idea, uh, Manu. The transport was a big issue because these stands would otherwise occupy a lot of space be costly to transport. So in this design, uh, there is no nut and bolt between the members. All of uh -huh. these members will just come off if you de uh, if you detension the string. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and uh, I don't know if I can. Oh, um, I should. Um, Okay, I think I, I think this is the mask testing device, but then I don't have much time. Uh, Manu, you may continue. Uh, we can talk about things later. Yeah, I think if you could just show the the video, that's just like a. Okay. Do you have that link on YouTube? Or I can. I, 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 yeah, actually, um, I have uh, I have oh, it, yeah, but it's this it's Zoom the third, thing is it's the third link. 
Yeah, but the Zoom uh, bar apparently uh, is blocking my view oh. for some reason. So <laughs> I, and I have no screen. clue. Yeah, unshare your screen. I, I, okay, screen. unshare, yeah. That's funny right. that it doesn't let you go. And if I search for... Uh, and is it on YouTube? Yeah, I, I just uh, shared a link uh, in the chat. Oh, perfect. Uh, chat. It's 10 minute video, so let me really Yeah, no, I think I'll, I'll skip a little bit to it to get a sense for sure. people to get a feel for it. And I think, you know, kind of one of the threads is really around building and designing products. Uh, so I don't know if people can see. Um, do you want to talk through a little bit of the more, not the technology, sure. but just the challenge to be here? And yeah. also the history of how we got here? Right, right. So uh, during the uh, COVID times, we realized that uh, masks, a lot of masks were available in the market, which were not tested. And these low quality masks appeared to be high quality and people were worried about it. People were getting a lot of donations of masks from various companies, but no one knew what is the quality of these masks. And so within our discussions in India COVID source, we, we realized we need to test these masks um, on a more local scale. So that- As many of you know, even fake masks. In the US that had no FDA or NIOSH approvals. And so as a right. lab, we test, set up a mass testing facility. I remember Ellie and many other people, we would get a box of masks from Bangladesh that we had to test. And from around the world, people would ship masks to us and that's not sustainable. And we are also not a testing facility. So it's ethically, it's not so fair for us. And we built that system. Uh, similarly, there was another one that Arnab and TIFR in India had set up uh, but the goal was, you know, how do you standardize that as a process? So this could be literally both at the manufacturer and at the hospital. So that's the set types of setups that right. we were making at that time. Right. And so, so the idea was just uh, how do you convert what these scientists are doing in uh, established institutions into a simple set of experiments or simple set of devices that could be uh, built and at low cost. Uh, so that was the germ of the idea, and that's all we did is, uh, as you can see on the screen, it's a simple uh, mask, and all we are measuring is the pressure drop across the mask and uh, particulate filtration across the mask, just two experiments. And uh, the challenge was how to put it in a box, and with minimum of the exposure of wires, of uh, you know complicated, scary imagery of sensors and stuff the top, there is a particle generator uh, and there is a flow sensor and from that you can measure essentially a pressure drop and then the other big part is which is very clever that we came up with that it's a differential sensor so it doesn't try to say oh this is the pm xyz you use a mask as a standard so it uses a niosh mask as a standard and then you can say what are the properties differentially to an already approved mask? Directly correlates to the ability of the mask to keep this whole system. So that's that's what the differential part is. Power is eventually, and two masks are connected through that venturi to these fans. So whenever the fans are running, the air is being sucked from either of these masks. Now there is this knob which allows for the masks to be, to be shifted so either this way or this way so you can select this mask or this mask which is connected to the remaining of the fan. and then subir while this is playing i'm curious have you had the chance to talk to any hospitals any sets of communities in some sense uh, or kind of any industry right. partner um i haven't uh because i just finished it this week and yeah. i'm uh, i realized some issues in it and the main issue being that um the pm measurements so the sensor that i'm using for particulate matter measurements inside the system affects is affected by the airflow 
and I have not really studied the airflow, the turbulence inside the system. So it's a very compact system with an unstudied airflow, and um, it is reporting higher values than uh, the outside PM sensor. And I, I need to fix that before uh, I can approach anyone else. I see. So you're saying in terms of thinking about that, because it's a closed cavity, uh, yeah. you see uh, as compared to ambient. Yeah. Uh, if it was so these not sensors, yeah, these sensors take a small sample of the air, and uh, based on that amount of sample in terms of volume, they compute the PM two point five per volume, right? Uh -huh. And so yeah. the volume, if it gets affected by turbulence or pressure, it. it's going to Got be it. Got it. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so I, I think I, I, I didn't see your point. One way of solving something like that is to have the volume of air that moves to be coupled completely. So it's a closed volume system, not an open yeah. air system. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. That's that's another way of doing it, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and since so maybe we're running out something. of time, one thread that sure. I'm just going to do here is uh, uh, another project that I wanted to mention and talk about if people were to go on the Frugal Science Class Projects 2020. Uh, uh, this was uh, something really fun that Subhir and a couple folks worked on in the first class. Uh, and I'm just highlighting projects because it's fun for you guys to start looking through sets of projects and things that you want to actually do. Uh, and I won't play this video. I can post it. Uh, it's really an elephant sensor made out of your computer mouse. That's all I'll tell you. So it can. the idea is to detect an elephant coming from miles and miles, but using some hardware that's already in your mouse. And as a, it's a real problem primarily because... Uh, farmers and many communities in India which live in zones, there's a lot of farmer elephant conflict. So you wake up and you find all your farmland trashed and you get mad and then you search for the elephants and you attack them. But if there was an alarm system that you could deviate the elephants that are walking around. So anyway, this is another project that's growing. And uh, But the, the ideas it uses is just really, really clever. So I'm just gonna leave it as a clue for you guys uh, because <laughs> Uh, one of the threads is uh, the same set of the scenario can also be used for earthquakes. And the insight, the key scientific insight came from this notion that actually elephants talk to each other by stomping over miles. Mm -hmm. And that's the aha moment that actually uh, elephants use these S waves and P waves to communicate. So I don't know if you guys have seen a mad elephant uh, and there are uh, there are many groups, and so it's it's uh, their stomp itself is sufficient uh, to be detected. And so, of course, uh, this is related to earthquake monitoring, which some of you saw the Turkey side of the story right now that's unfolding. So anyway, I think it's kind of a thread. Uh, uh, yeah, it's very valuable to get a chance. Take a look at all of the projects, uh, because starting this week, we're going to really be focused just on projects. Uh, okay, so we're going to transition uh, to uh, David, and I think Subhir, if you have time and you're around, yes. it would be fantastic to just have you as a mentor for certain sets of projects. Uh, sure. and you can also see there are lots of makers from India in the class this year, as usual, uh, and it's valuable to sort of have them uh, see role models of people creating design solutions and services uh, in a freelance kind of a manner. So you're not tied to some corporate system. Uh, yeah, so I think yeah. uh, there are meta lessons for them uh, to learn itself as well. Thank you. Okay, Manuel. so we're gonna yeah, transition to, uh, to David. Uh, do you wanna connect? Uh, I can just share my screen. Oh, that's, start. yeah, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, and uh, I think, Again, I'm not going to do justice to David as an introduction. I've known David for a long time now, on and off through many different ways. But uh, uh, one of the fun aspects, and also in both in his writings and other things, you guys can see, uh, once people have an aspiration, you can start from anywhere. Uh, and uh, eventually, ocean was your calling. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, there, there's lots of stories itself in that context itself. And I think, I guess, uh, 
Now, maybe in the very end, you should just also mention a word about experiment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do I have like 10 minutes? I think you have half an hour. Oh, great. Like, great. yeah. Well, yeah. I'm going to tell yeah. you guys a story. Yeah. yeah. So give me one second. There is a video that's playing here that I want to. The design will soon be open sourced. Um, oh, I see what's going on. This prototype Sorry. has some dimensions <laughs> which have to be explored. It was playing in the back. Uh, okay. Yes. Can you guys hear me online? Yeah, any thumbs up? Okay, cool. Great. Um, so I'm not a trained, I did not get a formal training in science or engineering. I spent a lot of my early life in the 20s managing a sailing school in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I met this guy, this my friend Eric, and I got introduced to him and he told me this wild story about gold, lost gold in the Trinity Hills in Northern California in the bottom of this underwater cave that no one had been to the bottom of. And he had this big vision that he wanted to explore this underwater cave and get to the bottom. And he wanted to build a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV. The problem was 10 years ago, these things cost $50,000. They were really expensive. They were big, bulky, unwieldy. And he and I had no money. Like we had $500 between us. Like I was sleeping on the couch. He was sleeping on some friends' couches. And so we picked like these design constraints for our underwater robot. Uh, it has to be less than a thousand dollars. It has to fit in the backpack. And this kind of goes to Manu's thing of finding these constraints and working at good constraints. I think this is the key to good design is finding out what the real constraints are and picking those constraints when you start to design. And so he showed me this underwater robot that he had this prototype that he had just started building. And this thing did not really work. Um, but it was a good like tool for talking about it and showing, hey, this is the direction we're going. Um, and so I said, why don't we share this online and see if we can get some help? And so we started this website called openrov.com. And it was really just a forum of people. At, it, at the beginning, it was just us. It was me asking Eric engineering questions. And, and uh, slowly, we started building this group of people around um, around the world who were just chiming in and kind of, I think, taking pity on us. But <laughs> it worked. And then we finally got something that works to the point that we went to the cave. And we it was a big setup, and it was a lot, a lot of fun. We brought all our friends. It was a great adventure. And we put the robot in, and we got to the bottom. And we found $50 million worth of gold. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, oh, we had so much fun. And you know, the story. You could have. Yeah. You could have. Yeah. You could have. Awesome. Um, <laughs> but it was a really fun adventure. And it actually got written up in the New York Times. And so we got a ton of attention. And so we quickly started, like, okay, we said we did a Kickstarter project and we said, okay, we'll sell you a kit. Of this underwater robot it's hard to build i mean you can see it's all laser cut parts because we were at tech shop and that was the only tool we had so we designed it like this this is not how you would you would not build underwater, a underwater robot out of acrylic laser cut parts this is not the best way to do it um, but the beagle bone computer was just coming out raspberry pi we were using off-the-shelf brushless motors which no one thought would work underwater but we just did it and it turns out it worked and so anyways there's a bunch of like little design things i could talk about in this um, but then we had this little business where we were selling these kits um, of underwater robots and people started building them. And so uh, this was a graphic that showed all the people who, they went to Antarctica, they were people wow. to high altitude lakes, there were uh, classes in, in Lake Merritt um, that people were finding stuff, classes in, in Qatar, all over the world. It was really inspiring. People were finding glass sponges that they didn't know existed in these different places. People were creating 3D models wow. and finding shipwrecks and Whoa. Um, so it was amazing. You got to understand, this was a pretty wild adventure for two people who didn't really know what they were doing. All of a sudden, we had this big community. We were invited to all these ocean conferences, and um, you know, being put up there with these the, some of the most famous ocean scientists in the world, who were really amazed that we were doing this. Because when we started, they said, "This isn't going to work. It's not possible." <laughs> and so we found this. And then we eventually made like a, we had some team and we had some more money. So we designed this, this product called the, the, the Trident, which was a, it worked right out of the box and it was, it was really easy to use. Um, and that's kind of the business kind of, uh, hold on a second, I'm going to show you some other things. Because the business kind of got interesting at that point um, because all of a sudden there's the Eric, there's the Trident. 
this is the path. Um, this is really the path that we took. Oh, whoops, let me stop sharing. Let me share the screen. Um, so it was this. I like the N of one, the N of hundred, and the N of thousand. Yeah. <laughs> Order of magnitude. It's really useful way really to matters. Like, how do you make one of something? Which is, you'll learn a ton from that. And then it's interesting. Well, how do you make 10 of those? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, how would we make 100 of them? And then eventually you can start thinking about, okay, what can we make 1,000? Mm -hmm. When we started making 1,000 of these things, so did a lot of companies in China. And so <laughs> all of a sudden, there were all of these knockoffs, and they, were, they started out, they were bad. Now they're really good. And you can go on Amazon now and get an underwater drone for 500 bucks. That it's going to work really good. It's going to plug right in. So I'm really proud. Like, we, you know, our open ROV didn't survive, but I'm really proud of all the things we did. And the other things that started on the forums there were all these people building um, better thrusters. You know, like they took every like different parts of what we did and branched off in different directions. So it's reshaped the kind of industrial landscape. And we also started working on this new standard because, and I can talk to you more about that. Um, but then we, we the company merged with this other company and we created this thing. Well, we merged with another company who was making buoys and we combined and created so far. And it's the same kind of idea, super low cost. This is what oceanographic buoys have looked like. I mean, just super big and the spotter, the little, it's a basketball size that's there on the right. I mean, it's much, much smaller. And um, people are using this in all sorts of new ways. And um, we have this kind of smart morning, so you can attach sensors. But one of the things we were, and then if you go to weather.sofarocean.com, you can see we've created the largest private ocean sensor network in the world. We've got 2,000 and we're routing ships and it's, it's a growing company in San Francisco. I'm not there day to day, but it's going and growing and I'm really proud of everything that they're doing. So, and then we're predicting weather, which is cool. But I wanted to show you this idea because I got inspired by, um, what happened with CubeSats. And mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of, if you don't know about CubeSats, you should read the story because it was started by a Stanford professor who wanted their students to be able to be able to launch things. And they created this small design and it's totally reshaped the way we design spacecraft. And the picture on the right is a group that started in the garage. That was the same garage we started open ROV and it was the couch Eric was sleeping on. <laughs> they started Planet Labs and now they're getting an image of every location on Earth. And so this is one thing I do want to talk to you guys about, because I think the bottleneck to space was launch. Mm -hmm. And I think what the bottleneck is to ocean sensing is this integration. So mm -hmm. if you start working in oceans, this is a site you'll, you'll see really fast. It's just all of these wires and, and things coming together. And anytime you want to build a platform or something from the ocean, it's like you have a sensor and you have to integrate it with a, a platform and it just becomes this whole convoluted thing. There's no easy USB for the ocean. Right, you know, everything is custom, and so that was one of the things we started to change. Um, and this is all, all the CubeSats and the effect it's had. But, anyways, um, it's called Bristle Now. And I'll just share a different screen. Can I ask a question? Yeah, hold on one second. I'm just going to show you this. Um, and so we started at bristlemouth.org, and so we're going to be releasing this open technical standard um, for uh, connectors for marine devices, pretty soon. So I'm really proud of that too. Anyways, that's pretty much what's been going on. I'm happy to talk about any of the design choices or um, anything about starting and running a company and that's a whole different adventure or anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Design choice question. Yeah. Why did you choose to make the buoys smaller? Because isn't the point where you're supposed to be like if you're putting in the ocean, smaller ones would actually be harder to find if you're trying to recover them again? Well, we don't want to recover them. I mean, okay. we made them low cost enough that you know they they show up on shores and things like that. We're throwing oh. them out of planes, like yeah, they're just how they're small and they kind of don't show up the environment. Yeah, they don't. I mean, so they've all got GPS and we can get the basically the we can get wind and waves, which is really what we wanted. Okay. Um and yeah, the, just, off the side of ships, like we the network, I, sh I should show you the. I guess the smaller they are, the more likely they are to go with the, the waves and the current back. Exactly. Yeah, but the, the way to think about it is often sometimes buoys are platforms for other technologies. Yep. And then you want to build something that is going to be anchoring uh, and yep. you can add more to it. While on the other hand, if it primarily is a sensor by itself, 
And so what's the lifetime currently for the so far? But they're still the, lit. I mean, some of the first ones are still out there. So yeah. three, four years. Yeah. They've been, they've and been then out. on the communication side, uh, is there a satellite link? It is. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. so now we have cellular too. So if you yeah. want to do coastal stuff and you want to moor it, you can do that. Yeah. Um, but, and then how yeah. much does it cost right now at the current buoys? They're about 5,000 bucks. I see. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I mean, that sounds like a lot, but it's. No, no, no. I think it's, yeah. I've, bigger I've, and then we this we is our bought. all of these are all our network so yeah. the ones that you're seeing here is our network <laughs> that we've mostly you know some of it is airdrop we have mm -hmm. a partnership with the navy now and we're throwing them out of yeah um, and is the data way. public by design or if you're doing research the data stuff, you can have it you can work with it no, no no so for example when someone buys a buoy to deploy it they uh, own that data they own that data so that data is not public that data is not public unless they want to share it and help improve our models. Yes. So then all of these are like if I click on any of those buoys, yeah. that data belongs to somebody. The, no, these are all so far. So far owns these. Okay. You have this is the so far network, yep. and then there this might be so far other and, and what there so might far be other people. With this is using it to better predict weather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And which is really important for ships, because if ships can save five percent, I mean they spend hundreds of billions a year on fuel. Mm -hmm. So if you can save them any money, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and we can. So that's what that's the main business of so far, but it's a lot of data and you know we're making available to researchers and stuff too. So mm -hmm. yeah, no, I guess as a as a business model itself, it's this interesting thing is you're solving somebody else's pain point. But on the other hand, there yeah. is a tool that can has much broader implications. But they start, you know, the the so we merged with this other company who really started with the buoy. And they were, it started off just selling ones and twos of these things. Just like when we were starting up an ROV, we were selling a kit mm -hmm. and we weren't selling it to anyone. We mm -hmm. wanted to make sure it was to makers and to people who wanted to partner with that. And I think that's that's a really underrated part of some of these stories is how humble they start and finding the finding markets and audiences and even at those earlier stages can be really, really valuable. I know, anyways, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're building a boat now, and now I want to. Now we're going to sell it as a kit because I really want the feedback from from all this. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I think it's. Uh, remember that we talked about the the power of ten film uh, in the class. It just, I think, uh, there is no other way to scale anything. Uh, you have to start from one. You and let let time learn. instruct you too. Yeah. Like, it, I mean, this boat we're building now. I mean, I you I'm so I'm too embarrassed to even show it to you. It's got so many problems, but where you know that's part of the journey is is working through those. I think the other big lesson is make sure you work with someone like Eric and I. Just have a ball. We just have fun all the time when we're making stuff, and he's an amazing got an amazing design idea, and I'm a good writer and communicating it. So you know, working with people you have complementary skill sets with and that you have fun with, just I mean, because it's a ten year journey if you want to do something like this, um, and I encourage you to do it because like. I think the reason Manu and I connected is there's this whole world of business people and, and startups and companies that are building products for markets and like have a real profit demand. And then there's all these academics who are doing all this stuff just to publish more papers. And there's this whole world in the middle of just doing things because you're curious. And what's been so fun is it's actually an interesting place to carve out a life. Because you get to meet people like Manu and you get to pull down adventures on oceans and you get you can build little businesses and you can um, publish papers. You can you can create a whole life there that I, I wish more people did. And I'm so glad to see all of you here because this is the best place to, to jump into that world. Yeah, there's, uh, there's something very common in what you just said and uh, Subir, uh, which is what I was just kind of describing as... Uh, uh, initiating because often enough then you're in complete control of at least the directions you want to go in which is much harder to do when you incorporate yourself in a larger organization yeah, but and i think there's power. becoming more and more infrastructure available yeah. for folks i mean one of the things that you know you and i found is sometimes you need to have investors and sometimes you need grant money and being in between in these in-between spaces can be yeah. hard and challenging but it can also be a, um more empowering. And to, to speak to that, I mean, one of the things I'm doing now is running this website called experiment.com. So if you go to experiment, it looks like a Kickstarter for science. And we funded more than a thousand science 
uh, you know, projects, lots of different, especially DIY science projects have gotten started on experiment. And I run, now we run this big grant program where we give five to $10,000 out for new, new ideas. Because when we got started, we got a really small grant that allowed us to, we showed up at these, these ocean funders with our first prototype. Yeah. And we were like, we want to explore the ocean, we want to build this big community. They said, well, what do you need? And we said, well, we could build 15 more prototypes if we had $7,000. <laughs> and they were like, because they were funding ships and yeah. like all this super expensive, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they were like, okay, whatever. And they just wrote us a check and they said, just bring us the receipts. Yeah. <laughs> and, we did. and then we put on Kickstarter. We became by far like one of the best stories that of the things that they funded. And so now we've got this dedicated fund where we can easily write, you know, $5,000, $10,000 checks. And Manu and I are working on one for Google Science where we're going to be able to fund the early stages of the projects. Because I think a lot of people think when you're getting started with one of these things, like a big constraint is money. Like, what's the market for this? What's all these things? But I think you do, just getting a, a small amounts of money to cover the cost to prototype it to see if it works is a really freeing amount of money. If you get a $100,000 grant or something like that where you're paying your salaries and you have employees, trust me, it gets a really unfun really fast. But if you have a little bit of money to cover costs and to build what you need, um, it can be it can be really free. So that's what we're doing. If you want to learn more about that, just you can check out experiment.com or email me or it's david at experiment.com. So. Yeah, no, and I think one of the threads is uh, the hope is that many of the projects, as you guys get serious, uh, then there are lots of ways and avenues to support that. And I think it really what's the the big transition point is really a commitment to a project not the resources and that really does it, it's more internal it's not external that's why i did it on experiment because yeah. having to ask in public yeah. like to crowdfund to to say to your community hey i'm doing this yeah. is a really it's, it leads out a lot of people who are not serious about yeah. their project and um having done a kickstarter project I mean, you've done a couple of them it's a powerful it's a powerful experience to ask the world for help and to see who comes out of the woodwork and so um yeah. and then you are you're driven to actually meet that exactly. Yeah. exactly yeah 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 okay so we're roughly out of time one of the threads that we're going to do is let's do a quick open mic uh, anybody any questions any threads both for Subir and David uh you can raise your hands if some of you want to turn your cameras on any questions, threads, discussions? Can I show my project? Does yeah. it work on the flow? Uh, oh, you brought it. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you just say a word about yourself before and then? Uh, yeah, sure. My name is Adil. I'm from Kazakhstan. <laughs> yeah, my background is mechanical engineering. And uh, like several years ago, I started working on a device for blind people to read electronic books. Uh, so on the market, there are a lot of different... Um, uh, braille displays uh, that uh, provide uh, like a, allows uh, blind people to read and text uh, it's kind of like a looks like a keyboard with a lot of uh, cells on it that produce uh, letters it costs very uh, a lot of money like a thousand dollars and my idea was like a wait a second will i like a spend thousand dollars for one just monitor never for display mm -hmm. yeah. because uh, the, uh, the laptops cost same same price mm -hmm. yeah and so i was <clears throat> curious is it possible to make it uh, cheaper uh, and i started uh, searching and the, how it works the process and the um, uh, main constraint was like a uh, as, uh, as more sales do have uh, it's more uh, comfortable but it costs more mm -hmm. so i thought that maybe we can like um, uh, get rid of uh, this all of this um, cells and just uh, leave only one. Yeah. So when you say the word cell, you mean resolution. Uh, it's just a one resolution. one letter, like a cell. It means like a one. Um, I see. Uh, let's say unit that produce one one letter. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I said maybe I thought that maybe I can uh, do only one cell. Put your finger on it mm -hmm. and just uh, scroll or uh, control the text by your another hand. Mm -hmm. So I built the prototype of this idea. Yeah. Then there was several prototypes. Yeah. Uh, so this, See, quite... this is a moment of reveal. <laughs> a very yeah. special moment, because often enough when you create something, you keep it to yourself. And when I was, we were talking, I was like, no, 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 you have to bring it to the class. It doesn't matter where you are. It really is very important yeah. to do a show and tell. 
uh, of like a, it's a kind of the last prototype that I presented for one contest. Yeah, but uh, so this is how, how it looks like now. So it's a base, you can uh, recharge it wirelessly. So you put your finger here, it's a cell that produce, now it doesn't work, sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's good. And uh, control the text by scrolling this scroll or uh, uh, dial, or mm -hmm. I don't know how to call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, your text like it goes under, uh, under your finger. Mm -hmm. You can control uh, forward or backward, for example, if you don't like get the letter or you can press the button and uh, it will be sounded like a, if you, for example, just uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even the prototype, building prototype, it costs about uh, $100, like a 10, uh -huh. 10 times <laughs> less than uh, yeah. this on the market. Yeah. But if we like to start the um, mass production, it mm -hmm. even uh, goes mm -hmm. um, less. Yeah. yeah. I tried different ways how to produce it. Pass uh, this around. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, go ahead. So uh, I started like a do it on the 3D printing it. Mm -hmm. And I said, I thought that maybe 3D printers are very cheap right nowadays and they, a lot of people can have access to it. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, at the same time, I was like a, a kind of a, a teaching uh, some uh, prototyping and uh, engineering uh, classes for uh, local uh, major space. And I thought maybe I can make uh, some kit mm -hmm. that uh, we can build, like uh, everyone can build, just buy a small uh, kit and then print it and then solder it and learn, uh, at the same time, learn how to uh, work with these technologies. Mm -hmm. And I uh, started uh, these classes for uh, high school uh, students. Uh, yeah, but then uh, the COVID uh, <laughs> pandemic started, <laughs> so I had to stop this work. But and I continue working on uh, on the like a uh, uh, build uh, the for for this uh, uh, shape and uh, and then in the development side, how much of this was in Kazakhstan versus when you moved? Uh, What's the history of the project? When did it start? When uh, so because I, started, I know you moved at some point of time, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I started working on this project in the beginning of two thousand nineteen. Mm -hmm. So, but then you were back in Kazakhstan or here? I, I've been in Kazakhstan this period. Yeah. I see. Yeah. And I just moved, I moved to. Oh, Kazakhstan. just for, just just for yeah. campus. Okay. Yeah. So, much of the development of this also is, oh, I just opened Yeah, it. yeah, that's fine. It's you fun. can just see yeah. this. Business. Yeah. No, this is actually fun to just see as in terms of parts. I'll pass this to a couple of people. So, I'm assuming this is uh, essentially solenoids. Yeah, uh, it's not solenoids. It works on. Uh, yeah, my first prototype was with, made by by hand, like it was yeah. uh, six solenoids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but now it's just uh, I bought it on you know, one uh, yeah. manufacturer. So one of the actuators designed yeah, for yeah, Braille yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah. It but it must be other... solenoids in the end, no? Uh, so uh, it's maybe, but it's just uh, produced. It's just so more compact. Yeah, yeah, a lot of yeah. sound and uh, yeah. noise, and it's like a. It's a custom to the, yeah. the yeah. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit to the experience of building and doing this in Kazakhstan itself? Because, uh, yeah. You know, it's one thing uh, for me to do it here on a campus uh, with all kinds of tool littered around us. And it's another. So, uh, yeah. yeah it, what was actually, that process like? Yeah. Uh, actually, there's, this, there's not a huge, this, like yeah. a big, a big community of open. makers in Kazakhstan yeah. because uh, our country is like a, there's only like a 19 million. Uh -huh. uh, in Kazakhstan, yeah. uh, and uh, our country is just uh, produce oil and gas. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is the world world the country. Yeah. And uh, 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 yeah, uh, when I started working on uh, some devices, prototypes, yeah. and uh, I uh, struggled of that there is no community and there is no people to ask something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just uh, trying to find some information in YouTube or internet. And then I said, wait a second, I have to start some community here and just uh, maybe maybe in the future there will be a bigger community. And so that's why I find this makerspace, mm -hmm. uh, which was like a, uh, raised by uh, our U U.S. embassy. Uh -huh. Yeah. And um, I made these classes for engineering, for like a design thinking mm -hmm. yeah, and prototyping. We, so I'll teach how to solder, how to make PCBs like mm -hmm. the circuit circuitry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how to build some uh, projects, how to uh, design in CAD and 3D print. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, 
uh, some students uh, uh, they decided to go to STEM, uh -huh. uh, yeah, to to become engineer. Yeah. And yeah. then is that space also still supported or like the space uh, yeah, that you created? It's yeah, it's still there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but mostly yeah. they use uh, like uh, learn English. Just <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I think you know, this is also a tough part of uh, creating something and then keeping it going is it takes a while <laughs> and uh even the transients that you all create uh in your lives are actually as important sometimes and it's such a beautiful story i'm just so glad that i convinced you to because uh yeah yeah um i think one of the threads that's associated because now the class will start turning much more about show and tell and really working on threads so any time any of you want to bring in anything that you're working on, you want to share, show, get feedback, solve technical problems. I think uh, we do this every year that sort of in the later half of the class, it really is much more about learning by doing rather than kind of the formal model that we actually take. So it becomes very important. This is a fantastic way to anchor and get you guys all excited about your own projects too. Uh, I couldn't have planned it better. <laughs> Clearly, the one thing that yes. came up with all those projects, fifteen prototypes later, twenty prototypes later, yeah. it's, it takes a lot. It takes yeah. a lot of trials at it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, I think it's also just this scenario of uh, uh, learning by doing, and uh, in some sense, even in a even when you have all the scientific tools and analytical tools, sometimes you still need to just make it. So there is something very different that happens when you physically form it. Um, okay, I think we're gonna run out of time. So any other questions uh, for everyone that spoke today? Uh, any last minute questions? Otherwise we're gonna pick up on Thursday. And I think Thursday's session will really be uh, writing up project ideas on the idea board and just saying sp very specifically what any of you are passionate about. Um, any last minute questions? Uh, I think what's fun is everybody that spoke is also part of the community and they're around. So. Uh, the goal of this is all of us to play both role of teachers and mentors and mentees at the same time. Uh, you can learn something and you can bring something to the table to share. So uh, nobody's going anywhere. So uh, when you kind of think about, Subir, if you have time and you can connect once a while, sure. that'll actually be really fun. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I know how to do the analysis for that curve. So I'll doodle something and send you. I think if you just make some weight measurements, it, there is a very clear way of which degree of freedom is really causing right. this flop code. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah I'll try, it. but we can connect on that later. Yeah. Um, okay. Bye, everyone.